And welcome back to another episode of Pokemon Knowledge. Ah, you ever just sit back sometimes, you just take a deep breath, and then breathe out, and you just realize that you're in, you're living in a very special moment in time, and man, this has been one of those couple weeks that I feel like we're in a very, very special moment in time, and if you've looked at the thumbnail of this video, I don't think it's going to kind of be... A surprise to you about a lot of this conversation is going to be but you know uh the other day i put up a poll and i got a huge turnout on that poll close to a thousand votes people polled and i asked one simple question what is the better buy and i put up brilliant stars booster boxes on pokemoncenter.com for 143 or lost origin booster boxes from pokemoncenter.com at 143 and 56% of all the votes came in lost origin now, where my bias is, I like Brilliant Stars. I think Brilliant Stars is a better set. But make no mistake about it. I'm not stupid. I don't live under a rock. I know how good of a set Lost Origin is. That Garantina Chase, the character rare subset, like, it's a solid set. Especially the, even for all tarts, the Aerodactyl, super strong. And uh, shout out to Garen M. Right before we went live, I actually looked over at the chat. And I did see Garen M in here. And... About a day or two ago, Garen shot me a message on Instagram and just pretty much said, Hey PK, Astral Radiance is out of stock on PokemonCenter.com, which I'm actually, I'm going to be honest with you. There's few times that I feel like I'm very shocked, but I was very shocked to see Astral Radiance go out of stock before both Brilliant Stars and Lost Origins, so that was pretty cool. I honestly thought that that would be one of the, the later sets. But then he asked the question, what's the better buy, Brilliant Stars or Lost Origin? And I responded to his comment with one single word, both. I, I know that's, that's the biggest cop-out. That's like a sucker's answer, right? It's, well, what's the better buy? Just both. They're both good buys. I don't say this very often. I'm also been, I'm going to be honest with you, too. I've also been putting my money where my mouth is, and holy credit card, I am doing some damage right now to the credit card, because I just see the opportunity. Now, this this might be our Icarus moment. This might be the point where we've all, collectively as a group, we all make our wax wings, and we're going to fly with the gods, and we get so close to the sun that our winds start to melt and we're all going to come crashing and burning. This might be all of our moments, but I just, this is danger. I'm in dangerous territory right now. And I think maybe a lot of you guys are in dangerous territory too. Like I am so overly bullish on just the hobby as a whole that I honestly believe that when these two sets go out of, uh, out of stock on PokemonCenter.com, they're just going to run. Now, we're also going to run into a weird moment, too, where because I think they're both going to go out of stock, like, very close to each other, and close to each other in this hobby can be a week or a month or two months. Like, when you look at 25 years of the hobby, close can be within a two-month timeline. What I think might happen is we might just be at the point where Whichever set goes out of stock first will be the set that wins in the overall argument of what's the more expensive, what's the better investment set. And I know for a lot of people out there, you might be like, you just said within one or two months, that doesn't matter in like the history of this hobby. And I mean that, and I believe that, but I'm also letting you know, just the thought process behind a lot of collectors in this hobby is just... The first set that goes out of print between Brilliant and Lost Origin because those are the strongest sets in Sword and Shield with obviously you got the outlier of Avon Skies, but we're we're not talking of Avon Skies right now. We're just saying right now, like what's the second strongest set? And there's gonna be a lot of people are gonna and I'm not talking your crown zenith, anything like that. I'm not talking specialty sets, main expansions. It's between those two, and I think the first one that goes out of print, or out of, not out of print, they're both out of print, but the first one that goes out of stock is just going to run. And then when the next one goes out of stock, which it will, it just will always trail behind it. I don't know why I feel like that, but I'm just having this weird gut feeling. 
And I think the problem is right now is we're seeing Astro Radiance. Still, some of them are available on eBay, so the quantities aren't huge. So prices are still staying down a little bit when you look at the lowest price you could pick it up on eBay from, you know, trusted sellers. But man, I'm, I honestly just believe Brilliant and Lost Origin are just going to run. And I don't know if you guys noticed, like, I didn't make many videos since last Thursday. And the problem is, is I didn't really know what else to talk about because this is just for me been so engaging because I just mentioned it earlier in today's video like sometimes you're living in the moment and you know that that moment is very special and in this hobby there comes times when it looks pretty clear that you can time things and I think that this is one of those like I will I'm okay with being wrong and this might be one of those situations where I'm wrong but it just doesn't feel like that. I'm not getting that feeling in my stomach. And every time I look at it, it's just like, do I want to buy another case today? And that's not a good feeling, too, when I just said, holy credit card. Like, you wake up on a random, today's Thursday at the time of recording this video, but you wake up on a random Monday morning or Tuesday or Wednesday, and you go and you do a little look on PokemonCenter.com, and you're like, all right, mm, these are still available. Well, add six to my cart. 900 plus dollars later because then it's after taxes and it's like that was a quick 900 dollars on a tuesday morning and it's just like dangerous how much more can you i mean can you just can you keep doing it like it does it make sense you buy a case every day i mean i'm not made out of that much money i don't think there's a lot of people who just wake up and it's like oh Tuesday was a close was a nine hundred dollar bill. Well, Wednesday's now a nine hundred dollar bill. Oh, Thursday, Thursday's now a nine hundred dollar bill, and it's like, holy credit card. Gotta just I had the I had to take my foot off the gas a little bit, but this could be like I mentioned that Icarus moment where we just we gotta we gotta be you we gotta be almost like it it almost feels like you gotta be not rewarded in this situation, right? This is the problem, too, is I, I have to catch myself, see, like, when I become too bullish in something and, like, try to pump the brakes. But, man, I'm going to be honest with you. It's tough. And I don't – I'm looking around at the market, and that's something I love to do It's just look at the overall market. And I always tell you guys is I'm just going to keep moving with – and when I buy stuff, I'm going to just at any point in any period in this hobby is I'm just going to buy whatever I think at the time is undervalued or wherever I think that at the moment that I'm spending like a single dollar that I'm putting my dollar bill in the place or the area of the hobby, which I think is going to do the best in the long term at that moment. So when I'm talking about Brilliant Stars and Lost Origin booster boxes today, if you if you've been following this channel, you know I've been kind of talking about Brilliant Stars booster boxes for what seems like ever. But go back a year from a year ago, I wasn't talking about them in the way I am right now. And when those things, babies go out of stock, I'm not going to be talking about them anymore as the buy. Like for me, the moment is now, today. Like today is the buy. And then when those babies go out of stock, I think they're going to run. I think both of those sets are going to run. And, and I, it's it's tough. You can't do, like, the one-to-one -one comparisons on other timelines. Like, you can't start going back and looking at, you know, like, the sun and moon timeline. You can't start going back and looking at the XY timeline. And you definitely can't start going back and looking at, like, the black and Y and the platinums and the heart gold soul silvers and the diamond and pearls and the EXs and the watsies. You just, you can't do it because then you really start to play tricks in your head, but... I'm looking at, you know, some of these booster boxes and some of the demand that still exists and some of the hype that is around these. The people that are in this hobby, like, they just love these sets so much. And I'm looking at what Evolving Skies has shown to us that it can do. You know, even with what Evolving Skies is doing, like, it's going to take a terrible time in the hobby and we're all just might as well just be bankrupt at that point to bring Evolving Skies down to like whatever call it MSRP for Pokemon Center which is 143 it's just at this point it's not even really possible there's just too many people out there that are there's too much buying pressure on the way down for a product like that that it can never get there 
And it happened pretty quick. Quick being subjective. Like, we saw it go from, you know, that 150 price point to the 200 to the 250 to the 300 And it sat at that $400 price point for a decent amount of time. And now we're starting to see it, you know, sit a little bit at 700 But 700 strong. And it's just... I hate to say it just seems too obvious. Because these are just the most dangerous sentences you can say in this hobby. And this is, to be honest with you, it's just the most dangerous sentences you can say in life. It just feels too obvious. Like, that is a bad sentence. I've very rarely in my life ever came across, like, people talking about putting money places and saying it seems too obvious where that play really works out for people. Like, it's very, very rare does that happen in, when you remove yourself out of Pokemon until most other things. But I just I, I keep trying to catch myself. and Because you got to be careful, right? Like, I haven't been careful. I told you. Holy credit card. I haven't been careful at all. But, you know... I almost question, you know, I, I felt the same way with uh, Japanese Pokemon stamp boxes. Last time I went really, really hard into something that was like, to the point where it was holy credit card, was Japanese stamp boxes. And, you know, those ended up playing out really, really well. Because I just didn't think like there was going to be a reprint of those. And it felt weird too, because I had a weird gut feeling that there weren't going to be reprints of those. And that is a market that I have no first-hand knowledge of the Japanese post office. Like, talk about being as far out of your comfort zone in this hobby as you can possibly get, and that was about as far out as I have zero first-hand experience on how the Japanese post office works and, like, what potential restocks of a product like that would have been like. I no clue. I literally just, like, was going by the seat of my pants in a way, just saying... I think that these cards, at the time, I thought they were undervalued, you know, because, well, it wasn't even just the the cards itself, it was the product itself. Like, I thought the box was really nice, I thought the stamp sheet that came with it was really nice, and then the two cards, when I picked up my very first ones and I saw the print quality of it, you know, being non-hollows, way easier to grade, I was just like, this seems too obvious. It ended up playing out great, but... We will, or I will, or somebody will, we will, it, it almost seems, I don't know, it's, I find myself doing, I, sorry, I know I'm studying all my own words, and I'm trying to, like, think, uh, like, how to put this in the words, but it just seems like we're living in a moment, and I, I feel like in a year from now, or two years from now, when people look back on the prices of Brilliant Stars booster boxes or Lost Origin booster boxes. I just wonder if people are going to look back on today at the time of, you know, at the time of this video and just say, yeah, it was so obvious back in February or April of 2024 when both of these products were on in stock on Pokemon Center. I wonder if people are going to go back in a year from now and like, look back on this timeline as a missed opportunity i always wonder that it's the same way as i wonder if people are looking back when i just mentioned the japanese you know uh stamp boxes with that pikachu and the cramorant two beautiful artworks i wonder if people look back on those and they listen to this video and they go that was a missed opportunity you know the same way as i look back on you know like the japanese team rocket briefcase a product that you know could have been pre-ordered for pretty cheap and then right after the pre-orders were, were dumped it was like 150 dollars and i remember like passing on those and i look back on them and i'm like i don't know why i did that like i like the product but maybe in the back of my head i was thought maybe we would get something like that in english and then it just never really happened or you know a lot of people look back on like the precious collection box a lot of people look at back on the uh, Mario and Luigi Pikachu boxes. A lot of people look back on those. You know, when those came out, those were relatively cheap products in, you know, for what it was. Beautiful artworks. There was a lot of people piled into those. 
make no mistake about it. There were people that piled into those, but the way people piled into product then versus the way people product or pile into product now is crazy. Like a lot, some people piling into those products could be they bought five of them, bought four of them. That was what like people considered piling into them. You know, you had a couple chances to grade those babies in a 10. I mean, people were giving them away. I mean, shout out to Dan Catchmall Collectibles. Old Danny boys out there watching this real time or after the fact. Like, the, his half art, half art Mario Pikachu was just a gift somebody sent him and a secret Santa gift. Because there wasn't the crazy value that exists to those now today. That is a great secret Santa gift. You get that in a PSA 10 today. But at the time when somebody sent him that, you know, it, it was like a $50 card it wasn't anything that totally broke the bank and people are never gonna like recover from it wasn't like that at all but the problem is is that could be the danger too is that everybody watching this video could probably think back right now and they can go there's so many products I skipped on or maybe they could look back forget all these I keep saying all these Japanese specialty products just talk about English products just I mentioned it earlier, Evolving Skies. How many people are looking back and going, why did I skip on Evolving Skies? And when you ask about like why, if some people skipped on Evolving Skies, the question is, have you ever found anybody who said Evolving Skies was a bad set? And the answer is probably no. And if you can name one, that is probably, you're probably the outlier. There's very few people looked at Evolving Skies and said it was a bad set. I mean, you looked at, what Rattle did when Rattle was doing his Moonbrion chases, he was getting hundreds and hundreds of people tuning in for those lies every time. And there was a lot of people that were like attached to him pulling that card because of the set. And like, it was fun to watch and because it was a fun set. But even at the point when Rattle was, you know, opening up a ton of Evolving Skies packs, it was very, very clear at the time what the trajectory trajectory of that set was, you know, in order for Rattle to keep those streams going, when he first started, he was able to just source, you know, the normal stuff. Booster boxes, you know, he was opening three-pack blisters, he was opening up ETBs, just the stuff that Rattle normally does on his channel. But as that stream kept going on, and as he was not able to pull that Moonbrion, he had no choice but to cannibalize down other products that had Evolving Skies in it in order to get his, you know, price per pack down pretty low, for Evolving Skies in order to even just financially be able to continue that stream going. Because even at the time, you know, booster box prices for Evolving Skies had already gone crazy. And the pack prices, you know, there was just so many products you can get it. And, you know, even at that time, I'm sure people are looking back and it's like, well, why didn't other people do that more? Why didn't more people cannibalize down those products? Why didn't more people try to do this? And I think that's a dangerous part of this hobby that... I think sometimes people live in the rearview mirror just a little bit too much. They're always looking at the what ifs, and but like the problem is with the what ifs, and I don't know if you would even call the what if a mistake, right? Because while you can't look in the rearview mirror all the time, it's just as is it. It's just as is it, it's just as important as you can't live in the rearview mirror. You can't not learn from your mistakes too, right? And like that's the trouble that people will fall into in this hobby too is you know a lot of people will never learn from their mistakes and they'll keep making that same mistake over and over again but then there's other people that when they learn from the mistakes when a situation like today happens it puts them in this very very dangerous position because they already say to themselves like no 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 i made this mistake once i passed on cases of team up i passed on cases of cosmic clips i passed on cases of Vavin skies i'm not gonna pass on cases of brilliant stars i'm not gonna pass on you know lost origin because i feel like it's just that thought of people don't want they already learned from their mistakes so they're not going to make the same mistake again but you know you just almost have to ask yourself because when you don't learn from your mistakes and you do something now today, what happens if this buy ends up being your mistake? And the thing that I'm struggling with the most is I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I don't think that I could come on this channel 
in a year from now and make a video talking about, oh my god, look at how bad of a buy Brilliant Stars and Lost Origin was. Like, I just don't see that video being able to exist in a year's timeline. Which is dangerous. Like, you know, a lot of people have the conversation of, like, you know, the bubble talk in this hobby. And one of the, that pass of, like, the bubble in any hobby is just, like, that crazy, like, exuberance. You know, it's, you ignore all warning signs around you and you just keep going, you know. It's just to the point where it's irrational. And I'm there. I'm there, baby. I'm at whatever that is. And But, like, that's the thing. It's how many times in the last, call it since the boom, so over the last four years, so from 2020 to 2024, how many times can you just keep riding up that that mountain, right? And just saying, this time... It just, it can't crash this time. 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 And as I, as I speak, as God is my witness right now, I'm looking at Brilliant Stars and Lost Origin going, it can't crash this time. You, you, hmm. It's question, right? It's like, gotta be careful. But at the same time, it's like, do you want to be too careful? And the problem is, too, is the more I make videos and the more I talk and the more I discuss with people and the more friends I make in the hobby and every single day compounds on the fact that I understand that we are as engaged in this hobby as, I, you know, I used to say we were in the niches of the niches. Shout out to Mr. Basic Trainer. But I think feel like we're getting into levels where we're not just in the niches of the niches we're in the niches of the niches of the niches and you know the fact that there exists people out there that when you look on a tcg player you look on an ebay and you look at sold listings for this product every day there exists somebody who is picking up product on either ebay or picking up product on tcg player when they could very very easily go on pokemoncenter.com and pick that product up for right now a lot of these sales you know between 30 to 40 dollars they could be saving themselves and i understand like we are in the niches and it's just it it combines it even and then even compounding on that is when i listen to people like from their most recent uh trips to collecticon a lot of people just came back recently from uh, collect con in LA and hearing some of the stories about people that are walking up to people's tables still today and they can't recognize like pretty like I don't know pretty like popular cards cards that you would think everybody would know like a like a card like this people still to this day walk up and they'll look on somebody's table and they'll go, what the hell is that? Never seen that card before. What is it? You know, and it's just, it's kind of wild in that sense too, that you can have people that can be so actively engaged in this hobby, so deep down the rabbit hole. So for us, everybody looks at that card. You instantly recognize what language it is, what was the release like, what card and the obviously this is the evolution what card you know predated this and you call it the pikachu you know how were they released how can you get them you know what were the prices at release what were the prices after release what is the price of this card in a psa 10 what is this price in a psa 9 what do these cards currently sell for raw and what are these cards currently sell for sealed can you are those sealed packs searchable you know, what is the big chase, obviously, in the Umbreon. Like, for most people, you can look at this card and you already know the history of it. You already know the backstory of it. You already know how it was released. You already have kind of an understanding of the supply. You already know what the 10 rate is like. You have already know kind of what the black labels for a lot of these cards sell for. You know what the difference between this card and a PSA slab price difference versus a CGC, you know, and then you're able to do those. You And you know what 
the prices were right at release for first to market grading, what they ended up going to. You know all that stuff. And all I did was I held up a card like this for a second, and you already knew all that information, especially them being searchable and stuff like that, just by looking at it. But then, on the like I just mentioned, on the same end of that spectrum, there was somebody at uh, Collecticon in LA, had this card in their booth, and somebody walked up to them, and they never saw that card before. And it shows you, like, we are in the niches, right? So then, it brings up the question of, do you just become so overly bullish on the fact that you know what you would consider to be common knowledge, right? So... I don't know. It's cards like this, which sometimes you wish you didn't know what you know. And then maybe you could just live your life like just free and carefree. And you don't overanalyze everything and you don't just. But I don't want to live my life like that. But I also have to understand like who the buyer of a card like this and a, like the buyer of this card. Like, they don't care. I don't know. Anyways, that is that is my PK rant. And, you know, this title might look like clickbait, but it's not. The end is near. I, I think these both those booster boxes are coming out of stock pretty soon. Listen, at this point, we already seen Astral Radiance go out of stock before both Brilliant and Lost Origin. If Silver Tempest went out of stock... I would be as shocked as I was with Astro Radiance. And I wasn't like overly shocked, but the days of cheap Sword and Shield booster boxes are coming to an end. They are. I don't believe we're getting reprints of any Sword and Shield product. I think Pokemon is way too busy right now with the Scarlet and Violet block. I think they're way too busy with 151 if we see a reprint might be 151. The only reason I say that is because Pokemon in Japan has already made it very clear that they're reprinting Japanese 151. And the problem is too is with that over bearishness is the same way as I just said today, you know, Brilliant Stars and Lost Origin, you know, booster box cases are where I think the best value is right now. Come May, when that Japanese 151 reprint comes, I already told you, cases. One word when it comes to the Japanese 151 restock, just cases. Go. That's all. Buy cases. Buy as many cases as you could get your hands on. Forget single booster boxes. You know, those cases, they come in uh, cases of 12 because... And then just pick up as many as you can. And it's funny, too, because I, I talked about this in a, a video just probably about a week or two ago, when the Japanese 151 reprints were announced, I talked about this, and I said my sweet spot for those booster boxes, and when it really, when it comes to cases, is $1,000. It's just like a nice round number. Don't get me wrong. $1,000, that's still like double MSRP, because those booster boxes are $40. In order to get $1,000 a case, it works out to be like whatever, like $83 $83 and change per box but like that's the number that I said would be nice but I also said in that video is I wouldn't be surprised if prices were able to drop below 80 and I think a lot of people like totally took those words out of context as it was like oh PK thinks that they're going to be $60 booster boxes while I hope that they were $60 booster boxes and if they print enough of those while I think that that is potential any if you Pokemon prints enough of anything, they could drop the prices low. And if they print enough of 151, I believe $60 booster boxes are possible. I'm not going to rule that out. But I also, in the same sentence, damn near in the same breath, I also said that I would be very happy picking up cases at $1,000, which is $83 of booster boxes. So people only ever hear what they want. They never really like think deeper than that, too. In the same way as, you know, I'll say, I want thousand dollar cases but i wouldn't be shocked if it goes down to 60 and then the same way as people instantly go oh see that pk just 
PK says all the booster boxes are going to be selling for $60. Like, I didn't say that, but I would like that to happen. In fact, I would like, in a perfect world, to get $50, $40. While I think there is some chance out there that exists, I think that is chances very low. And then the lower that dollar amount comes, the closer those chances pretty much get to damn near 0% chance of that happening. But the same way as, you know, people will hear what they want. It's the same way, too, as, like, the average buyer and investor and collector and the thing that i get most there's a lot of things that i question all the time and it's the buyer of some of this stuff too which you know i just ranted for whatever close to 30 minutes telling you why i'm so bullish on this product why i think it's such a good buy i'm going to tell you i'm like what the thing that i never understand is in order to be bullish on this product you always need two things one, you need to be the seller. But number two, you always need to have a buyer out there. And that buyer always has to be willing to pay prices that are way higher than your, they have the opportunity to buy it today. And the sad truth is, is right now today, I feel like those people are going to, in a way, always exist. The same way as I do the first to market play and you know, you find a card that has beautiful artwork, good fundamentals. Good fundamentals could just be fan favorite Pokemon with good artwork. First to market, grade that card, get a PSA 10, and the first to markets always sell for a premium. And I don't know why that happens, but one thing that this hobby continues to do is show that happen over and over and over again. The same way as in the movie Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray, just living that same day over and over again, that first to market play over and over again. And then eventually you see supply hit the market until eventually prices start to tank until eventually they'll hit the bottom, whatever that is. We saw something, well, first, we definitely saw it happen with the Pikachu and Grey Felt Hat promo. We saw it happen with the uh, Classic Collection. Before that, let's just keep it on you know Pokemon Center promos. When you look at the Special Delivery Charizard, when you look at the very first Special Delivery Charizard that sold in PSA 10s, sold for greater than $1,000. I sold my Special Delivery Charizard for $625, and that was at the time I thought I was late to the party. But... You know, still selling for three twenty-five. To look at what that card is selling for now today, it's a huge retrace from those early prices. You know, and it's just, it's and it's the same thing. Even looking at like set cards for Sword and Shield. If you want to look at a crazy set card that right at release had crazy high prices, Vivid Voltage V Max Pikachu selling for greater than fifteen hundred dollars to what that Pikachu V Max in a PSA ten is selling for today. Don't even get me started at what the price of a PSA 10 VMAX Charizard from Darkness Ablaze was selling for at its peak versus what it's selling at today. For a card like that, we've seen close to like 95% retraces in the PSA 10 price, you know? But like that's the thing. There's always a buyer right at the beginning. That's why you can have a card like the Darkness Ablaze Charizard retrace 90 five percent that is a ridiculous profit you know profit that is a ridiculous percentage for a card to re retrace 95 percent like uh it's wild when you think about some of this stuff you know but uh i think that's the thing too it's the hobby just has this way this to repeat itself constantly same shit over and over and over again uh, all right, I'm going to go scroll up to the top of the chat, and uh, I see a lot of people out there. Uh, I see number one mod in the game, Drew, Neb, uh, McNick, good to see you, buddy. Pull Father said the thumbnail is fantastic. Katie, good to see you, Katie. She said, one pill, two pill, red pill, blue pill. We about to take them all, yeah. Katie Lowen, she's uh, the next Dr. Seuss. I, I'm going to read that again. One pill, two pill, red pill, blue pill. Yep, beautiful. Uh, Flower City Cards, good to see ya. Uh, Pokemage87 said his body's ready for the rant to end all rants, yes. Um, Garen M, appreciate you being a channel member, buddy. He says, hey, so Garen M was the one that also messaged me and asked me which one I thought was the best buy, Brilliant and Lost Origin. And I know it's the cop-out, I know it's the sucker's way out, but just saying both. And 
I don't think I make this video in a month from now or two months from now. I think they're both out of stock and that at that point, prices will have run away. They'll be selling for, you know, 170 probably right after it goes out of stock to 200 to 220. And I think both of these sets are going to be the stronger performers. I think people are looking at Fusion Strike right, right now. People are looking at Chill and Rain. I think both of these sets surpass those sets really, really quickly. And... I'm not going to be talking about them as being buys in two months from now. I just don't see that. Now, if they're still available on PokemonCenter.com in two months, then I'm going to ask myself the question, holy shit, how many Lost Origin booster boxes and how many Lo how many Brilliant Stars booster boxes were actually available at PokemonCenter.com this whole time? Because it must have been a metric fuck ton. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pokies, uh, let's see. Uh, Pokemon Dentist said, Sup, PK, good to see ya. Felipe de Sosa. Uh, Gym Leader Pepe, uh, Poke Kid, and Aaron, appreciate all three of you guys being a ma channel member. Appreciate it. Really uh, appreciate the support. Especially need all the support I can get because holy credit card, been buying cases. Pretty wild. Uh, Roxandy, good to see you in the chat, buddy. I haven't seen Roxandy around lately. Where you been at, Roxandy? I feel like Rock's always in the background. Just I feel like Rock must watch a ton of content. My man just consumes it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Felipe, you're funny. Ancient Mew said Fusion is a gr great set too. Fusion is a very good set. All of like Sword and Shield are solid. Like with the exception of the early blocks, but like that's a weird thing where you know, Sword and Shield base, Rebel Clash, like, you look at what prices of those, but that's the point where scare, scarcity is kind of outweighing demand for a lot of those sets, and, you know, it'll be interesting in the, in the five-year, ten-year timeline when people look back, and what does a set like Sword and Shield does, when, does that rare, or does that scarcity factor, like, outpace the popularity? I don't think it will ever... I don't, I don't see a situation where Sword and Shield and Rebel Clash are like the number two and number three for top performing sets. I don't see a point where Evolving Skies is number one and then Sword and Shield base and Rebel Clash are number two and three because of that scarcity factor. I think they eventually they fall out a little bit. It's just that they're scarce right now, so the prices are you know strong for what the sets actually are. But yeah, I think. Five years from now, we're going to be looking at the top five are probably going to be, you know, and then this is, it's tough too, because I've mentioned it before, but like Silver Tempest is still available. Does Silver Tempest is a solid set, Lugia, it's got some, you know, big hitters in it. Does Silver Tempest outpass Chill and Rain? Does it outpass Fusion Strike in the future? Or is Fusion Strike a better set than Silver Tempest? Now that we're starting to see Astral start to run a little bit, where is Astral going to fall in this whole conversation, you know? I can't wait for the like five-year clip from now just to look back because I think in five years, wherever these sets wind up in five years from now i think that that will be the order that they'll stay at so if evolvent's number one and lost origins number two and brilliance number three or brilliance number two uh lost origins number three that four and five spot if it is fusion strike and chill and rain or fusion strike and lost origin or lost origin fusion strike however not including crown zenith in that conversation wherever that is in five years i think that that will be kind of where it just stays for forever and you kind of always see that happen. So, it's interesting. <laughs> um, somebody said, po uh, Arjun said, Pokemon Battle Academies will go to the moon. You know, people make fun of Battle Academies, but if you ever listen to Rusty TCA Gaming, like, listen to how Rusty interacts with different products, how Rusty lists stuff. If you listen to the way that Rusty interacted with the Battle Academies, he did fantastic on those because he just had them as, first of all, he was able to pick up 
battle academies for super 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 cheap like distribution wanted to get rid of those things at all costs so he was able to pick those up for just fantastic prices and then they came with the three cards in it it came with the charizard the was it the was it the gyarados and the and the Raichu, I want to say that those were the three. But either way, all his Charizards, he sent them away, just mass graded them to PSA. Got whatever, like a couple hundred of them back. And then he slowly was listing, or he didn't just slowly list them. He listed them all with like a huge quantity. And he ended up selling through all of his Battle Academy Charizards to the point where he actually ran out of them. And then he had the be able to acquire more of those battle academies in order to get more of the charizards to send them away for grading again because the way rusty's business a part of his business is set up is just having huge bulk listings of slabs and just selling them one at a time with the amount of traction his ebay store gets too that he gets a lot of eyes on those there are a lot of people when they do that simple search term and they're getting back into pokemon they're gonna look at and once they understand grading, they're going to understand, okay, PSA is the best grading company. PSA 10 is the highest grade you can get. Charizard is the chase Pokemon. Oh, what is this? Some Charizard from a Battle Academy. They don't even know the product, but they see it in PSA slab. They see it's a 10. They're willing to pay a premium for it. And then bingo, bango, that's how you move through a couple hundred of those babies. So that's the thing too. It's like even a product like that where... Battle Academy should be a meme right now. That should be a meme in this hobby. That In this space, it's like Battle Academy. That's what a shitty product. But I just gave you an example of somebody who navigated that product with like the best way to navigate that product. Get in at super, super cheap prices, mass grade these babies, and just sell them over the course of a couple months till eventually he ran out of those things. Like that's that's Pokemon though. That's this hobby, where the memeiest product that exists, the sh some people would say the shittiest product that exists, could be like a great play in this like space, and that's exactly what Rusty did. You know, but like that's the thing too. It's like some people will look at a product and they'll just look at the work that goes into it or whatever, and they'll just they'll pass on it. But like. This hobby is so forgiving. This hobby is so rewarding. That a play like a freaking battle academy, when you put that product in the hands of a right person, and the right person is somebody that has you know in depth knowledge of the market and how to sell stuff. When you put a shitty product in that person's hand, they're gonna take that and they're literally gonna turn it to gold. So, it's wild though. Uh, big bad basic trainer. I think it's a. Uh, we're running into the timeline pretty soon where we might have to have a basic trainer live stream. Maybe not this month, but definitely in this summer we'll have a basic trainer live live stream. But he basic said reprint everything. Yes, basic reprint everything. How? I I'll, I'll ask the chat in a hypothetical situation. How far back could Pokemon? I mean, really go? Not in the hypothetical. Well, technically, Pokemon could go back to as far back as they want and they can reprint anything that's not what i mean i don't mean like in the extremes like that but i mean in a more realistic sense how far can pokemon truly go back and reprint so i think a lot of people would say well pokemon could go back and reprint anything that is currently in rotation but then other people will say no pokemon could go back and reprint certain sets even if it's not in rotation as long as it's collectible or that product was never really like a playable thing in the first place. Like a good example of that would be Hidden Fates. So a question would be like, could Pokemon technically go back and reprint Hidden Fates? Because by reprinting Hidden Fates, it was never really like a question of, oh, Hidden Fates, first thing that comes to everybody's mind is, oh, the playability that came out of Hidden Fates. No, it was a collectability. So could you make the argument of that? And then if you could make that argument, how far back could you really go before that even in a hype but this is a thing there are people out there even though that i'm putting this as strictly a hypothetical their brains will melt like just to say well in a hypothetical situation hypothetical meaning in the name 
hypothetical people will that will be triggering enough just to say you know what if let's just have a friendly conversation of what a hidden fates reprint could look like there will be some people out there their brains won't even let them get there because they'll just be like no 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 not possible won't even have the conversation and it's just it is what it is uh derek lavender said no we need to reprint the pony true yes <laughs> Fresh Tat says, reprint all and only Charizard. Can you imagine if Pokemon was like, uh, for the 30th anniversary, we're going to come out with a Charizard set. And all the Charizard set is direct Yu-Gi-Oh! style reprint. So a Yu-Gi-Oh! style reprint meaning you can't even like tell the difference between the original card in the set versus the reprint card. What if Pokemon was like, for the 30th anniversary... <coughs> Shout out to Professor Oak. What if for, for the 30th anniversary, we just reprinted every single Charizard that has been in a set in the last 10 years? So, break the hobby. <laughs> just like every Charizard ever printed. So, you open up a pack of 10 cards and you get in Flash Fire Charizards, you get in Evolutions Charizard, you get in Classic Collection Charizards, you get in Celebrations Charizards. Obviously, Pokemon would never do that. Again, there's trigger warning for everybody out there in my hypothetical conversation like which will never happen will trigger some people but that would be funny that would that everybody would lose you just would lose all faith in the hobby like people would i would say that people would run out of this hobby kicking and screaming but there are some people who would just love it too um Roxanne, said he kind of feels like Silver Tempest is really good. Silver Tempest is solid, man. Lugia, Lugia as a chase, solid. You know, Garantina for uh, Lost Origin, Aerodactyl for Lost Origin, solid chases. Brilliant Stars, Charizard for the chase, solid. Fusion Strike with the Mew, with the Gengar, with that Altart Celebi, solid. Even go back to Chillin' Rain. All the legend, it's, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Oh no, my OBS has disconnected. Did we reconnect? Hopefully we've reconnected. Oh, I don't know where that cut off. You might have saw like a weird clip right there because my OBS just disconnected in the middle of my rant. So sorry for that, guys. Uh, Giovanni's Pikachu says, is that the first your first question when you wake up? That is one of them. And he's mentioning when I'm looking on PokemonCenter.com to see what is out of stock. Uh, Tom B said, that really the right answer, though, yeah. Um, the Frisky Squid said, I was extremely surprised when I heard Astro was out of stock. Like, four or five months ago, it was around $120, which led me to believe there was a ton of stock. I mean, even right now, with Astro going out, I think the cheapest price I saw on eBay right before this live, because I was just curious, was like 136 or 135 with $6 shipping. So it was still technically under that MSRP price that was selling on PokemonCenter.com. But there wasn't many quantities left at prices like that. Um, big shout out to number one mod in the game, Drew, dropping the 10 memberships. Drew, I appreciate you, buddy. Drew, is a, he's a good one. Uh... Ancient Muse said, just have the discipline to not open everything you buy, LL. Oh, when it comes to booster boxes, I don't I don't open booster boxes. I open other products, mainly just like all the auxiliary products and stuff like this. Like that's that's the thing, and it's something I talked about in my other live, and I'll talk about it in this live, and I'll continue to talk about it. Uh listen, I'll be honest with you. We get real wrapped into the investing and the collecting of this hobby and stuff like that. But no, make no mistake about this. This is this hobby still has to be fun for you. And if this hobby, to, part of that, you know, for it to be fun for you is to go out and spend 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever, $50, even 50 bucks, go out and buy a collection box and open up some packs of the newest set just because you want to be, want to experience that set because you want to have fun opening packs. Like, don't get so blinded by, like, the invest in and the flip in. Don't get so blinded by that that you're not even able to still find the very, very simple joys of just opening up a handful of packs. Like, if you find yourself getting that deep into the rest of it and you can't even find the enjoyment in open packs i would just you know give you a little bit of advice to just take your foot off the gas pedal a little bit and just 
kind of remember like why you're in this hobby to begin with. Because one of the things I talk about all the time is if you don't love this, if you don't truly love what you're doing in Pokemon, there probably are better places for you to put your money. But more importantly, forget money. There's probably better places for you to put your time. Because time is just this most like fleeting of things we have. If you look at your life and you look about things that are renewable, there is nothing renewable about time. Every day that goes by, every second, every minute, every hour of every day, that is just one less second, hour, minute, or day that you're never going to get back. So you have to find your usage of time doing something that you truly enjoy. And that's one of the things I talk about with Pokemon all the time. Like I truly get enjoyment out of this hobby and i find that the time i spend in this hobby is worth it to me and part of that like is just having fun too don't let this ever stop being fun because i can't really ever say you're doing something wrong but if you find yourself in this hobby not having fun in my opinion i do feel like you're doing something wrong you never should let this stop being fun and one of the best ways to continue this being fun is not just that pack open experience, but reach out to people. I'm telling everybody out there, reach out to people, grow in this hobby, make friends, join discords, go to Collecticons. Listen, I will be at the New Jersey Collecticon. If you guys don't know anybody and you still want to go, feel free to walk up to me. Say, PK, where's the trade night tonight? I will tell you. PK, what bar are you guys all going to after the trade night? I'll tell you. PK, are you guys all going out to dinner together? I'll tell you. There's no secret. There's no nothing. It's it's a very welcoming, very opening, like, very... It's just this community is just fantastic. From the top of the top to the bottom of the bottom and everybody in between, everybody's great. There are some people out there that I don't... There's only one person out there that I don't really care for because of, he does personal attacks on people, me personally. But everybody else, welcoming, very welcoming hobby. Uh, Aaron said, Dave, <laughs> Dave Ramsey also wouldn't be happy if you don't drive a 91 Camry and eat rice daily. Use uh, CC. So... You say drive a 91 Camry. So I do not drive a 91 Camry. But I'll throw a little stat at you. That is a true stat. Swear on my children. This is not a made up a made up thing that I'm about to tell you. I got my first car I ever... First car I ever got was a gift from my grandparents. Huge boat. And since that time, since I was 16 when I got my first car... I've only ever owned three cars in my entire life, and I still own two of the three. And the first car I ever got from my grandparents, I ended up having to scrap it when I ended up moving out to North Dakota. But the other two cars that I've had in my life, I still own both of them. So I am not like, while I enjoy cars... I'm not all about cars. I'm all about getting my most bang for my buck. That's why in my entire life, in my 20 years of driving vehicles, I've only owned three vehicles, and I still own two of the three. So I do agree with Dave Ramsey a little bit that you don't need the newest, flashiest car. So that's just the way I am. Now my wife, she's gone through some cars, but me personally, nope. And I've always had two cars. I've always had a very nice car, and I've always had like a work vehicle. And my very, very first job I ever got when I was... Well, so when I was real young, I used to work at a marina. I don't want to really... Ah, sure, we'll do it. Why not? It's If you made it to this... I'm just going to put it this way. If you made it to 54 minutes in this video, you'll probably enjoy this content. You'll probably enjoy listening to me rant. So I'll do... Something I very rarely do on this channel is I do a little backstory of just like PK. But uh, when I was in high school, I used to sand and paint bottoms of boats. And I used to work the gas dock on the weekends. And it was great. I used to make $8 an hour. The IRS has entered the chat. Under the table, $8 an hour in high school. And then when I would work the gas dock, I would make a bunch of tips. And that was great. And then because of... Like, because of that job, I ended up 
getting a job working on like uh, like pilot boats and stuff like that. And I when I was 18, I got what's called like a 40 hour Haswopper. So I was doing like marine oil spill response cleanups when I was 18. So when I was still in college, so I and then my pay was twelve dollars and fifty cents an hour. And I was, you know, in college, senior year, or probably right after senior year, that summer I turned 18, and I was able to get my 40-hour Haswopper. So, at the time, I was, and then I made $12.50 an hour, and I thought I was fucking rich. I thought I was the richest dude that ever walked the planet, because at the time, I was making $12.50, and my friends were, like, you know, in high school still working, you know, crappy summer jobs or one of them was working at a grocery store like pushing carriages and stuff making whatever minimum wage at the time was which was probably like i think minimum wage was like six dollars and change seven dollars to change so i felt rich but at that job one of the things that i took from that job was the owner had a ton of money ton of boats multiple like different uh like yards he used to run had a ton of money had like really really super nice cars at home um he had one of the original like 1967 uh shelby cobras like if you ever seen the movie ford versus ferrari like that two-seater he had one of those cars at home in his garage dude had just a ridiculous amount of money but every day for work he used to drive this like old chevy jimmy truck super beat up and he used to have like the people that used to work there would like work on his car for him because it was always falling apart and i asked the guys that work there i was like i know what kind of cars he has at home in his driveway why does he never drive these type of cars to work and all the guys said they were like because he always feels that if he's going to be the manager and if he's going to be the owner he doesn't want to like show off in front of his employees he always wants to re relate to his lower like paid employees and that was when I was 18 and I always took that to heart so as I got older I was always like I want to always kind of keep like a older beat up work car because of what he did and because of how people respected him as an owner and how he was never flashy with his money as I got older I always wanted to feel the same way and even in my job today my car, my ve my work vehicle gives me a ton of character. So when I pull up to different sites, like, first of all, you're super easy identifiable. And, and my car's not falling apart either. Like, it's still well-maintained. It still looks nice. You know, it, it, it looks visually appealing, like, for the age of some of my cars. And, but, like, that was something I always, for whatever reason, because of that at 18, as I've gotten older, it's stuck with me my entire life. And even now, like the job I work at today, every single car in the parking lot is an Audi A8, Range Rovers. Like everybody I work with, you know, they're all making decent money. Like I make decent money too. If I wanted one of those cars, I could have it. And that's all my parking lot of is at work is and just everybody's got raptors and they got the newest cars that come out and you know my ceo just gets new white range rovers all the time but then there's always just my car there and i think that i get more respect for the vehicles i drive because i think it's a better representation of me as a person where like sometimes it's not flashy it's not the materialistic stuff thrown in people's face and that's just something that's always stuck with me and it'll probably stick with me forever. And the day my car finally disintegrates around me and I can no longer drive it will be a very, very sad day. But like I said, if you listen, if you made it to this point in the video, that's your one PK little backstory. But uh, yeah, but no, it so it actually worked out really well because that job that I work doing oil spill response, I worked that, uh, I would come back and I would work some summers in high school until eventually when 2010 hit, there was the oil spill that happened down in out, uh, the BP oil spill, which happened in the Gulf of Mexico. So because at the time I had already three years of oil spill response experience by that point, that I was ac actually able to be a captain of an oil spill response vessel down in the BP oil spill because they were just looking for people around the country who had marine oil field response training. And that's all I had. Like, 
I deployed Boom for that job, you know, WIC and cleanup materials. Like that, that's all I did for the three years prior to the BPO spill. So when that happened, it was like a huge opportunity for me. So I went down the uh, BP, BP uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. I was captain of a spill response vessel, did that for a while. And then this was the whole time I was still like going to college full time as a student, ended up taking a semester off for that, ended up graduating a semester later, but it didn't matter. And then when I ended up getting my job in the oil field, everybody always asked me when I got my job as a petroleum engineer, they always said, they didn't call me PK, but for the sake of this story, I'm going to say it as they call me PK. But they asked me, they always said, how did you get this job? Because the job I got was one of those type of jobs that you had to know somebody. Like I worked with a lot of people. They were all like, you know, they all had doctorates. They were all, you know, doctorates in like, um, like chemical engineering or if not doctorates in chemical engineering, like geophysics and stuff like this. I was working with people with master's degrees and doctorates from Yale and Harvard and all this like wild stuff. And they always asked me, they said, how did you get this job? Because most people needed to have like a huge in to get this job. And very, very few people ever made it through the interview process. And how did you do it? And I told them, I said, it was very simple. When I graduated college, I had a great resume up to that point. Had a 40-hour Haswhopper from the, like pretty much the day I turned 18 to, you know, captain of oil spill response vessel down in the BP oil spill. And then obviously I graduated, got my degree. And then when I moved out to North Dakota, one of the things that they, the reason that the recruiter called me and they told me this after the fact is that I just had a very interesting like resume because I had a ton of experience, but they said more importantly, I had a phone number with an area code that they had never seen before. And I graduated from a college that everyone had heard of but nobody had ever applied from. And just being that different enough was enough for them to, when I sent them my resume, for them to give me that very first phone call. And then obviously after that phone call, you have to prove yourself and you have to go through the interview process. You gotta do all that stuff. But that's sometimes the hardest thing in life is just getting that one phone call, that one person to take a shot on you. And in my case, I was just different enough at that like with that resume just different enough for them to give me a phone call in the first time and then when i went out there and then because i got that job and then to the job i have now like everything just very very like well compounded itself to where now i'm in a position that i'm very happy very i consider myself well compensated i'm very very happy at the point in my life and it it was a very long process to get to where I am now and it's it's wild too when you start to think back on time like how I tell you time is so important and just like to think now that you know all the people I've graduated with you know I, I'm talking to them some of them got like city jobs state jobs you know these guys are eight years away from collecting pensions four years away five years away and it's like man, did it happen that quick that we, like, you have 15 years experience in the workforce? And I just told you a story where I got very lucky sending a resume out right after college and getting that phone call. Because I remember at the time when I would go look at positions, every single position was like, you know, three years experience required, five years experience required. And I always remember thinking that in my head is, how do you get experience for an entry level job? It doesn't make any sense. But now looking back on it, it's like, now I got 15 years experience on my resume or 10 years experience. And it's just like, it's wild when you think and you look back on stuff like that. Anyways, if you made it through this, that was, uh, I looked over, that was a 12 minute PK rant on just my life. There you go. You get it. I don't do a lot of those. I mainly stay Pokemon. But if you guys don't know, Every Thursday night at 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is my weekly live, and I do get to take a few liberties every weekly live, and that's one of the liberties that I get to take today is just to give you guys like, a little rant about me. Um, <laughs> Pole Father said, I just went all in on Crimson Invasion, feeling good about himself, yeah. Can't go wrong with old Crimson Invasion, man. Especially if you're a waifu collector, man. No, that's funny. 
Uh, Jester Beat says, I'm buying all the Trainer Gallery, Gallery English and Japanese cards for $2.50 and grade and all the tens and holding the singles. I can't keep product sealed. Yeah. Yeah, if you literally have an inability to keep product sealed, then hell yeah, man. Go for it. Buy the singles. Do the graded play. And, you know, $2.50, $15 to grade it. You're all into those cards for whatever. We'll call it $18. You know, your downside risk versus your upside risk, especially if you're a good pre-grader, you, you can do pretty well. And especially at $2.50, if you just either, one, hold on to the cards and just kind of wait for the market to recover maybe those cards to sell for a little bit more you can make money there or if you just sell them back and you break even you could do pretty well doing that sort of play it's a lot of work but you know don't don't knock a couple bucks here and there too like sure it's nice to look at the big flashy six figure you know buys and s sells but the reality of this hobby is those big flashy six figure sales that is not the norm. The norm is the nickel and diamond and the grinding and being down in the trenches of this hobby. That's just what it is. Um, Giovanni says Japan has a solid post office as expected. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fresh Tat said Stamp Cramorant is beautiful. Uh, Pikachu is mid. Oh, hot take. Uh, oh, I'm pretty far back on the chat. I got to catch up. I'm going to. Let's see. Uh, the Pokemon Dentist. Intra hot take he's got here. He said, The modern day Mario Pikachu is Japanese trading card game classic. Everyone is asleep. Same when I bought it. A bunch of uh, booster boxes back in 2018 feel similar. Ooh, interesting. Pokemon Dentist. I, don't, I can't really agree with you 100% that the Japanese trading card game classic is the next Mario and Pikachu. But the Japanese trading card game classic... They do have some beautiful borders. I'll give them that. Uh, let's see. Think Forward says, you can only pick one set, Brilliant or Lost Origin. If I can only pick one, I'm going Brilliant Stars. But for the cop-out, buy them both. But if I, if I had a gun to my head right now, and they were like, you have to pick one, Brilliant Stars or Lost Origin, I'm going Brilliant Stars. So I got the gun to my head. Somebody's yelling, Titi Mao! Titi Mao! Brilliant Stars! <laughs> Thank God. Good old Russian roulette. Uh, so fresh tats. Ooh, great comment right there. He goes, "What if the Ch what if Chinese comes out with a Mario Pikachu?" Great question. Go for it. Go for it. You know, it's just like uh, with the nine colors. I I recently picked up some nine colors. I don't even. I gotta check my eBay. I. I know I'm expecting a few of like the jumbo booster boxes that haven't been delivered yet. I should probably check on the tracking. But the problem is is sometimes with uh, buying stuff from China is sometimes you get super lucky and it could come in like two weeks and then other times it's two months. And buying stuff from China, it's really iffy with timelines. So, But you did remind me that I do need to look because I want to say, God, I got to be coming up on over a month. That I picked up some of this product that I'm still waiting on. Um, Jimbo Slice says, I'm excited to see what happens. So Lost Origin and Brilliant Stars, if Fusion Strike can shoot up to 220 a week after it goes out of stock. Yeah, I'm interested too, man. I think it's... I, I think they're going to be... Man, yeah, this is where the danger is. If you made it this far, you get the dangerous comment. I think they're three hundred dollar booster boxes. Yeah, you heard it. Fuck two twenty. I think they're three hundred dollar booster boxes. Wild to say that, right? This is a booster box that you can still pick up on PokemonCenter.com. I think they're three hundred dollar booster boxes, and they're gonna go quick. I think. But the we in that, but like that's the thing. You need somebody out there buying them. They don't just get to 300 without people buying, keep buying up the supply to get it there. But that's where my my irrational exuberance in this hobby comes from, where I think that there will be enough people buying up all these booster boxes to actually make them $300 booster boxes in the very near term. Uh, Pokey Chef. Good to see you, buddy. So what up, PK? Pokey Chef, I am going to do my best to be at the Charlotte Collecticon. Um, I'm definitely going to be in Jersey. Just 
really unfortunate that uh, between Jer Jersey and Charlotte, they're only like two weeks difference. But I'm I'm probably not going to vend in Charlotte, but I will be there as a guest. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to see you while I'm down there. Uh, <laughs> Local Los Collection says, since I got into Pokemon, it's been trouble. Yes. Trouble, make it double. Uh, let's see. Fresh Tat says, lessons learned. Noobs will buy weird-looking cards. Yes. Um, Luck said, what are your top five favorite cards from Sword and Shield? Ooh, good question. So my number one favorite card from Sword and Shield is actually from Lost Origin. It's the Sleepy Pika. It's... So this is my number one. And then for number two is Sleepy T from uh, Battle Styles. Number three is probably the Pikachu full art from uh, Vivid Voltage. Like the one with that pink background to it. Beautiful card. Beautiful. I just... The color scheme for that Pikachu is beautiful, especially being a full art. Love that card. Number four would be... I know you guys aren't going to want to hear this, but number four is probably the Moonbrion. I didn't want to put Moonbrion in my top five, but it's probably my number... It's Yeah, I think it's probably my number four. And then number five... I want to. I was gonna say Gengar V Max from Fusion, but shout out to Cool Trainer Ryan. I'm gonna go with the Cellu BV Alt Art from Fusion Strike. So, those are my top five. But like that's the thing. Your top five do not have to be the most expensive cards. Don't ever have your top five cards be the most expensive cards. Um, which sucks that I put the Moonbrown in there. Sorry for that, guys. But the Moonbrown is fucking awesome too. And. Moon Brown's going to be one of those cards that is just going to show the strength of modern forever. We're already kind of seeing what it's doing. Crazy supply, crazy PSA 10 pop, and the prices are still able to like keep going up. So, cheers to Moon Brown. Um, all right. I'm so far back in this chat that I'm going to skip a little bit, and if I'm skipping your question it's not personal guys i'm just trying to catch up a little bit to the chat so if if i do skip your question and you do want it answered write it now in the chat uh, <laughs> uh cheval says pk probably still sitting on more special livery charizards than the number of zits i popped on my face during my teenage years <laughs> i'm sitting on a lot of special livery uh charizards I, I think it was Mason said the most PK story ever is when I tell the story of the last available day you could pick up special livery Charizard was on New Year's and I was at a New Year's party walking around to every single person in well first of all it was a New Year's party I knew a lot of people but there were still like 20 people at this New Year's party and I walked around to every single person and I asked them if I could use their phone and I because I had a bunch of special delivery Charizard codes that I uh, went on their phone, did the minimum order from PokemonCenter.com, put my special delivery Charizard code, and then had the package mailed to their house. I did that to like 20 people on New Year's Eve. And Mason uh, Barry said that's the most PK story ever. But that's also a true story. I did do that. And then there was like... A couple months timeline where I was having to like slowly get all these uh, special delivery Charizards because obviously the boxes are being mailed to all my friends' houses and you don't see everybody immediately. So it took like a couple months for me to see every single one of those 20 people in order to get my special delivery Charizard. So that is a true story. But I'm all, I was all about special delivery Charizards. I do, I did get a lot. I still have a lot. I don't even, I don't even want to grab them, but. They weren't easy 10s either. I got a lot of 9s. I think I still got a lot of 9s probably 
listed somewhere. I don't know. I can't even don't even know which account the Charizards are listed. They might be on the Poke Knowledge. I don't remember. Um, Max Power said, "What up, PK? Just saying, hey, loaded up on some uh, Brilliant Stars booster boxes last week. Yeah." Pokey Steve says, "PK never shows me no love." Pokey Steve, I appreciate you, buddy. Love you, buddy. Uh, appreciate you being one of the true OGs of this channel. I want to say Pokey Steve has watched a lot of this, a lot of my videos, and I appreciate you, Pokey Steve, sir. Being out there and being a real one. Well, I got a lot of real ones in this chat. I'm, I'm, I'm very, pr very privileged and very lucky to have the viewership that I do and the people that constantly, live after live, week after week, just one they keep tuning in. But the people that keep tuning into the lives, I appreciate all you guys. Um, Son of a Merc says, I feel like Lost Origins got printed way more than Brilliant. No. It feels like that. I I will I will agree with you. That does feel like Lost Origin was printed way more. But just from the poll I did, it seems like people prefer prefer Lost Origins over Brilliant. Maybe so. It's hard to say. Brilliant was one of those weird ones where, while it wasn't really available at distribution, Brilliant Stars was always available at PokemonCenter.com. So it always, in a weird backhanded way, felt like there was a actual reprint of brilliant stars but it just got funneled 100 percent to pokemoncenter.com because it always felt like there was a lot too but it's hard to say um mobile prodigy said i picked up a few battle academies for like seven to eight dollars each yeah even people with distribution like distributors were making people do bundle deals it's like oh you want any booster boxes well you got to pick up a shitload of these battle academies too and there was a way to navigate those um <laughs> Typhlosion Collector said they literally reprint base set every five years. Maybe not a true reprint, but they definitely reprint a lot of base set cards every five years. I'll give you that much. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Shivalves said yes preach pk hobby is super rewarding true with my hobby losses i was able to diminish my 2023 income tax return and now i'm getting a tax return i'm sure i was glad they glad they hear you got a tax return because of all your losses man uh and dan catch them all collectibles has entered the chat <laughs> uh uh mobile prodigy says i don't know if they can go f that far back the new uh, borders to me means Pokemon is done with yellow borders. That's why Pokemon Center is absolutely loaded with the last few Sword and Shield sets. Um, yeah, I don't think the borders really matter too, too much, but could be wrong. I'm trying to think if there's... I mean, they're able to print the classic collection and stuff at the same timeline. I don't know. I, I don't think the borders sh really matter that much. Um, Son of a Merc says Brilliant has a Karen and an Umbreon uh, is there in there as well and other evolutions. I'm just biased with Brilliant Stars, I guess. Yeah, the Karen's Umbreon. So, yeah, beautiful card too. Uh, yeah, what is it? It's like part of the trainer gallery in Brilliant Stars. Yeah, beautiful card. Uh, Pokemon Breeder Max says a take. Everyone focusing on Sword and Shield. Uh, and it will create a vacuum where Scarlet and Violet becomes more expensive than Sword and Shield in five to seven years because it seems as seems as less investable right now with no explosive price growth like Evolve and Skies for now. Uh, I like where you, I like I enjoy a hot take, Pokemon Breeder Max. I don't personally agree with that take, but I do agree. I do appreciate hot takes. I got to the point where number one mod in the game, Drew, dropped the 10 memberships. Appreciate you, Drew. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Kite says, PK still open stuff? Question mark. Very rarely. Actually, uh, I had some friends come over just a weekend or two, and we went to an all-you-can-eat sushi place. It was a lot of fun. I actually brought the kids there. People there love my kids. I've been there so many times. It's, we, Me and my wife, we have a problem when it comes to going out to sushi. Go out to sushi. Way too much. We are just... Even today, we were talking about going out to sushi soon again. But uh, when we got back, 
I brought up some packs of cards and I let them open up. And one of the, my friends was like, this is so much fun. He's like, I got that childhood nostalgia kick. I'm like, pump the brakes, man. I'm like, <laughs> careful. I'm like, this is, this is giving somebody a pack of Pokemon cards is like a drug dealer giving somebody drugs. And like, it's the same because you just get them fixed, right? <laughs> That's a bad way to put it, but it's kind of funny. Uh, Cruz well, Mr. Cruisin' for a bruisin' TCG603 said, I tried to buy that $135 plus $6 shipping on eBay for Astral and it wouldn't let me add the cart and says the item is no longer available. So the cheapest right now is $169.99. Oh, okay. I didn't try adding it to the cart. I was just looking at prices. So that's interesting if that's already sold out. Uh, so PokeKid said uh, he'll be at New Jersey. Good uh, yeah, Poke Kid, we'll definitely meet up in Jersey. Uh, he said, him and Fargustus may come hang out with you. Yes, definitely. Definitely see both of you guys. Uh, Mick Nick says, I'm in for Jersey too. Oh, it's gonna, look at that. It's already turned into a party, man. It's going to be, yeah, Jersey's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> Tom B said, oh, you are a doc bitch, as some would call it. Yes. Some would call it. Dude, I used to love working the gas dock. Like, as a high school student. I mean, because way before I did the oil spill response, like, sanding and waxing, bottom, like, sanding and waxing and painting bottoms of boats was my job from literally the point where, I, when I turned 12, when, was when I started doing that, until all the way, I did that for, like, five plus years and then even when I was doing all the school response I was still working the gas dock in like on the weekends I love that like that was oh yeah those are good days uh so Joseph said PK no doubt an opportunity that seems like a no-brainer by cases will be a missed opportunity yeah I I think so I mean that's what I think I could be wrong but I I just find it, I'm I'm hard pressed in a year from now to look back on this live and say oh, I was really stupid saying the by lost origin and brilliant stars cases a year ago I just don't see that but maybe uh, uh, let's see the Pokemon dentist said great story uh, I got a very much wanted dentist job in Tampa after a bunch of his buddies interviewed he said he hired me before he met me because he saw me pull up in his camera uh his camry there you go man it gives you gives you character uh so local los collection says does anybody in here recommend the graded plastic that you can buy from ebay to see if your card could get a 10 i have no clue what that is is that like a centering tool plastic one? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, Tap said Mario Pikachu is one of the biggest collabs uh, IPs ever. A reprint of a reprinted card for the 12th time is not the same. I don't even remember what I was I don't even know what that is referring to. I don't even remember like the context of what I was saying. Um, let's see. Tom B said, preach. He packed 15 orders during the live. Tom, I'm glad to see you're on that grind, man. If you're packing 15 orders, good for you, buddy. Uh... <laughs> Shabal's got the comments of the night. He said, bullish on the hobby. I'm like PK. I stock up on steel cases before even thinking about fulfilling my ch children's basic needs. They'll thank us someday. Thank us someday, yep. Uh... So Tap said Gengar VMAX is one of the best Gengar arts ever. The art style is so perfect for Gengar for sure. Uh, Sword and Shield stand out. Yeah, definitely. Sword and Shield's had a lot of bangers, man. Uh, people are saying they think Gengar is as good as Moonbrion. Yeah, it's solid artwork. Uh, Pokemon Steve says LOPK, you're a real one. I was just messing with it. Nah, I appreciate Pokemon Steve, or Poke Steve. Um... Mobile Prodigy, his top five are is the Blaziken, Gengar, Tina, Moonbrion, and Ray Ray Alts. All going fucking crazy right now. Oh, oh, there wasn't his top five. He's just saying that. Yeah. I mean, 
alts are doing what alts do. They're, I mean, think about how tough alts are in the pole, man. It's when you. I'm not gonna do the whole PK rant going through every single timeline, but you look at pole rates for cards in different timelines and different. You know. It's not comparable today at all. You see how how many packs did uh, rattle half the pole to, to how many packs did rattle half to open the pole that Moonbrian? close to three thousand. How many packs did Cool Trainer Ryan have to open the pole that Blaziken V Max? An absolute metric shit ton of them, you know. And then you go back to certain timelines of the hobby where you know big chases were introduced, and you think about uh, Gold Stars. V stars were one out of every 72 packs, so that's one out of every two booster boxes. You buy a case of booster boxes, you're ideally going to get three gold stars. We're so far. I mean, that used to be the chase back then. Now, we're talking potentially to pull the actual cards you want, thousands of packs. So, yeah, I can see why some of these alt arts are doing what they're doing. But then you also get an alt art like a Sandaconda V. Still has the same type of pull rates five dollar card so it's not it's it's not always about how tough it is the pull it's still also there's a huge factor involved in artwork fan favorite pokemon like that stuff is still required like i just mentioned that scan santa Condor v or the skunk tank v skunk tank v is just as hard the pull as an alt art as any other card but when you look at the prices the prices are just not there um Let's see. Um, so think forward said, count me in on Jersey. Are you vending PK? Yeah, I think I'm vending uh, Jersey because I could drive there. So because I can drive there, I could just bring a ton of shit with me. So the Jersey Collecticon, I I GP I map or uh, GPS it, Google mapped it. I think it's like between two and two and a half hours away. So very close. I was originally going to do something really stupid, which was I was just going to wake up early on Saturday and drive there. I decided that was really dumb. Really thought twice about that. I'm not going to do that. So probably going to go on, fr take off work on Friday, drive there on Friday, get a nice hotel, relax, go out to dinner with the guys, go out and get a couple drinks Friday night, and then you know Saturday morning go full speed at uh, Jersey. Um. So Smoke Red said, "Do you see? Uh, did you see the Magikarp Illustrator rare from Paldea evolved? Or, uh, or Paldea is at one thirty on TCG player. I did not see that, but I'm telling you what, that Magikarp it's pretty impressive what it's doing. I mean, out of all the cards too, the Magikarp is just so selling for so strong." Uh, so Jumble Slice says, do you think there's any market manipulated with the Iron Crown or just very hard to pull and people brought, bought off the cheap ones? I think that there was probably a market manipulator to help get those prices up. But the problem is, is there's just so few of those cards on the market that even if one market manipulator dabbles in that market a little bit, it's very easy to change the price trajectory of a card. So while I do think that that Iron Crown started off as market manipulation, I think eventually people just you know, instantly, like, put this new price to that card. And even, and in a way, it. a lot of people out there might not want to hear this. And for those of you that don't want to hear this, stick both your fingers in your ears and hum when I'm about to say this. But the truth is, here's your chance, hum. Market manipulation sometimes is around the stay. Meaning, you just manipulate things one or two times. That's a new price point. Everybody loves most recent price points. Everybody loves comps. It just becomes what it is. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so Pokey Steve says he's down by Atlantic City. He's been on the fence. Go for it, man. Dude, you're so close. Like, go for it. Even if you just do like... Like one night, one get go one night at a hotel. So maybe you drive down Friday, stay Friday at the hotel, go to the event on Saturday. And then it's worth it. Even if you just do one night and then you drive home Saturday night. Or if you can afford it and you can make it worthwhile, go down Friday, 
stay at the hotel Friday night, whatever the venue hotel is. The Jersey venue hotel really is going to suck because I think it's like 15 or 20 minutes from the convention center. That blows. I'm going to be honest with you. That really sucks. You really want the venue to be like attached or right across the street. So this one's unfortunate. But yeah, get the hotel, get the room, meet up with people, have dinners, have drinks. It's the best way to interact with this hobby, man. Um, all right, made to the bottom of the chat. Uh, Derek Lavender said he's in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He thinks he'll drive down the Jersey also. Also, awesome, Derek. I look forward to meeting all you guys there. But yeah, man, everybody out there, I made it to the bottom of the chat. If you could do me a favor right before I sign off, just hit that like button. I don't ask for much, but if you hit that like button, it really, really helps me out a lot through the YouTube algorithm. And if you're new to this channel, which I'm going to lean towards zero people are new to this channel, made it to the end of this hour and 30 minute long live. But in the very, very small, minute chance that you are new to this channel, you made it to the end of this live and you are not subscribed to this channel, do me a favor and maybe do yourself a favor. Hit that subscribe button. I do go live. I usually don't give a lot of notice. So hit that bell notification if you want to be notified when I am going live. If you do like to join in the live chats and just interact. But other than that, you can watch this after the fact. But as always, guys, appreciate every single one of you out there. Again, big shout out to number one mod in the game, Drew, dropping the 10 memberships earlier. But as always, guys, I'll catch you on the next video.